You know, it's been almost 200 years now since that famous night when Paul Revere looked up into the church tower there in Boston and saw the lantern which signaled to him the approach of the enemy. Now, in the period of time since then, there have been a great many changes, but the one change that has been most important to all of us is the fact that today our two oceans, one on either side of the country, are no longer barriers to a sudden surprise attack. Now, let's watch this. Now this is an enemy bomber. Now what we saw there could happen to any of us. Fortunately, it is the responsibility of the United States Air Force to prevent such disasters. The old lantern of Paul Revere's time has given way today to such modern things as the electronic eye, which sweeps the sky both by day and by night to prevent the arrival of any unwelcome intruder. So let's look now at our all-important radar defense screen. To tell us of this, we are privileged to have as our guest on Science in Action, Brigadier General James W. Andrew, United States Air Force. Welcome to Science and Action, General Andrew. Thank you, Dr. Harrell. I'm glad to be here. I'd like to point out that while the Air Force is responsible for air defense, we are closely assisted by a group from the Army and Navy, as well as a very important group of civilians known as the Ground Observer Corps. Well, in looking at this map over here, I can see that uh, it must take a tremendous group in order to do all of the things that you have to do. We have some three million miles, square miles of territory here in the United States and just about 10,000 miles of both border and coastline completely around the country. It's such a big job, Earl, that the Air Force has made the uh, Air Defense Command a major command of the Air Force with headquarters in uh, Colorado Springs here, headed by a four-star general, Benjamin W. Chidlaw. He has his command divided into three Air Defense Forces. The Eastern Air Defense Force, made up of three Air Divisions, the uh, Central Air Defense Force, made up of five air divisions, and the Western Air Defense Force, made up of three air divisions. This area is covered by a network of radar stations with overlapping um, areas, something like this. In other words, then, if one of these radar stations should go out, then the radar station on either side could cover that area without any trouble. That's right. Well, I know that your command headquarters are right here at Hamilton Field, and when I look over to this relief map, I find that Hamilton Field would be just about at this point right here. Not so far away, up on the top of Mount Tamalpais is a very strange looking ball. Now, I know a lot of people have seen that and perhaps have seen other things in other parts of the country that look like it. Now, what is it and what does it do? I'd be glad to talk to you about that, Earl. If we'll come over here to this model, I think I can show you a little better uh, what it is. This uh, bubble, which you spoke about, simply covers the antenna of our radar station. Uh, primarily, it's a protection against the weather. Uh, we can't cover this antenna with metal, nor even with material like wood, which would be held together with metal or with nails, because the metal would interfere with the radar signal. So this radome, as it's called, is made of nylon reinforced rubber, which is very strong. It's inflated by compressed air, just like a balloon. Well, since this uh, bubble is a sort of a raincoat, then uh, let's take off the raincoat and see what's on the inside, the important part of the insulation. Here, of course, we see the antenna. But before we examine this in detail, perhaps we should find out just what radar is. You know, since World War II, radar has uh, become a household word, but it's still somewhat mysterious. Well, radar is a coined uh, word, Earl, and I could explain it simply like this. RA stands for radio, D for direction, A for and, and R for range. Radio, direction, and range. It's simply a method of using electromagnetic waves to detect the presence of objects which 
are beyond our normal vision. Well, now, these electromagnetic waves that you speak of, those are the same waves that we use in radio and also in television, but here in radar, you use them for a different purpose. That's right. Uh, radar seems mysterious because we can't actually see the waves, but we can demonstrate the principle rather easily by using water. If I drop a pebble uh, like this, uh, you'll notice that it starts a series of ripples that move out toward the edge in circles. When they hit an obstruction at the edge, they start coming back toward the point where we drop the pebble. Then in radar, the transmitter would correspond to that same pebble, and uh, as it sends out its radio waves, the waves that hit an obstruction, they bounce back and be reflected back to the radar station again. Yes, and since our radio wave travels at the speed of light, which is 186,000 miles per second, the echo from an object 200 miles away would come back almost instantaneously. In fact, we have to measure the time in microseconds. This installation here contains both the transmitting and receiving antenna for a radar station. Well, you know, it looks somewhat like a dish or one of these futuristic things we see. Uh, it doesn't work that way, of course. Well, not exactly, but it's somewhat similar. I'd say that this uh, dish appearing affair uh, acts somewhat like a mirror. The radio energy is transmitted up through this little horn right here. It's reflected back onto the antenna or mirror concentrated and sent out into space. Now, if in this uh, concentrated area, it should intercept a mountain, a ship, uh, or an airplane, it will uh, be reflected back onto the antenna, be picked up in a sort of reverse direction. Now, I just plug this in, and of course, we can see it moving around. And over here, we have two aircraft. Here's an interceptor here. Here is an enemy aircraft. You notice each of them has a uh, small light underneath, and as the radar antenna comes over, it uh, turns on this light. But then we have something else happening down here. And what happens here, General? Well, I think this Bendix uh, model here gives a very good illustration of the way we intercept uh, an unknown aircraft, Earl. As the antenna goes around, this beam of energy, which I spoke of, is thrown out into space. And as it intercepts the hypothetical bomber track, it sets up a little blip of light right there. Now we have here an interceptor on its way out to intercept this hypothetical bomber. And as the antenna goes around, it uh, makes this little beam of light right here. Now, uh, the radar operator will be sitting in the middle of his scope, right about that point right there. In other words, this sweep hand, as it moves around then, would, uh, uh, would leave these marks as we see. That's right. He, uh, he has a series of concentric circles, something like this by which he can measure the distance which the uh, blips are away. And as this hand, this sweep, goes around, these spots of light are illuminated, as you saw. Well, that's a very uh, simple demonstration or an explanation for a complicated piece of equipment. We have one of these over here now, and I see the operator is just warming it up. Uh, there are all sorts of dials and gadgets there and everything else. And before we actually turn that on, perhaps we could look again, General, at uh, a photograph of what the sweep hand's going to do now as we see it moving very shortly. Well, yes, this shows it very well. Here is a, an illustration of the sweep hand, which I spoke of here, corresponding to the line which I drew on the radar scope. Here you see the little blips of light which correspond to the concentric circles in this manner. Here you have a rather large blip of light which would uh, show a radar track. That large spot is probably a bomber or a group of smaller planes. Here you see another bright spot, which is probably an interceptor such as this going out oh, to intercept yes. the bomber. Well, I can see here that the signal is starting, and then as it starts in, uh, the hand begins to swing around, and uh, very shortly, as it moves around, those little bits of light that you mentioned come into uh, place. There are two planes approaching each other, one from the east and one from the west. You can see the blips are getting closer together. Since we can figure the distance the plane has traveled in a given length of time, we can also determine his speed. Then by utilizing another antenna, we are able to determine his altitude. By this time, a plotter would be able to start plotting the course of these planes on his board. Now this uh, plotting board that uh, we have here in the laboratory, I understand is very, dim uh, very simple to, uh, similar to those that you have at various radar sites in the Air Defense right Network. Here. And of course, as you mentioned, the purpose is to correlate all the information Callie you get home. on each plane in flight. Roger. Incidentally, I notice your man there and has to write backwards, and what amazes me is that he can write backwards and do it very quickly. He has to be able now. to do it fast. All Those right, planes really move. Our two planes are coming right along. I think we might take another look at our screen. Uh, Roger. You see how the flashes are coming very close together. Our interceptor to the right is getting close to the unknown. Now they're almost touching. 
At this point, if the plane was friendly but unidentified, the interceptors would send back an identification. You have two types of grids there. In other words, uh, starting from the point where he would be located in the center, you have a series of circles, and then over right, that you have 15, superimposed a number of squares. Now, just what does that mean, and uh, how significant is it? The radar operator represents the hub of these concentric circles. Right. When he calls out the range and direction of a plane on a scope, he's speaking of it in relation to his own position. Uh, but if I'm trying to follow the course down here at Hamilton Field, it wouldn't mean a thing to me. In other words, it'd be like somebody in the next laboratory saying, well, now, where are you, General? And you would answer him, well, I'm standing uh, one uh, foot to the right of me. You wouldn't know either where either one of us were. That's exactly right. So we have this circular diagram, or polar grid, which uh, I wanted to point out and did point out a while ago, these concentric circles, which give distance. But over that, we can, we can place a geographical grid, something like this, which, uh, by which we can tell the exact position of a plane regardless, because these are measured in latitude and longitude. And one of these squares will always be the same no matter where you are any place in the world. That's right. You can always find it. Well, let's go now to a typical radar center or a direction center and see the type of work that is carried on there. Now, uh, I see the huge plotting board, very much like the one that we have here. And I notice that there are a number of scopes there. Uh, uh, those have different sectors, do they? That's right. You'll notice the two men down at the table, down in front. Uh, they are the tellers who are in direct communication with the control center at the airfield. And the men in the back then would be the, uh, uh, they would be responsible. Those are plotters. Uh -huh. Carry yes, on sir. the work there. Yes, sir. Those are the tellers there. Well, now, I can see how you could correlate all that work there, but let's look at this map over here, because here's something I'm not clear on. In other words, uh, you could tell a plane and identify it in the continental United States, but what if you had a plane out here in the middle of the ocean? What would you do then? That'd be no problem at all. To save money, we've set up what we call a corridor system, something like this, with five corridors, that's a little larger than it actually is, something like that. Now, the Civil Aeronautics Administration has uh, set up a system whereby they give each pilot who leaves Honolulu a sealed envelope. And uh, in that envelope is a set of instructions which uh, he must follow very closely, because if he gets in the wrong corridor here and follows the wrong instructions when he opens his envelope, we send an interceptor out to determine who he is. And uh, if he's all right, then you let him come in. But if it happened to be somebody else, why, then the interceptor would be able to tell about that. That's right. Usually they're in the right corridor. We've saved about $30,000 a month since we've set in that uh, system because uh, interception is really an expensive process. Well, I know that in your control center, these little raid stands, as you call them, are vitally important. Uh, they're rather complicated, so I wonder if uh, you could uh, perhaps set up one of these here and give us an idea as to what uh, these various uh, uh, markings mean. I'd be mighty glad to do that, Earl. I'll, I'll make up a raid stand for you. Here's... Uh, the top block, which is the identification of the aircraft. And this happens to be a yellow block, which would indicate that he's uh, unknown. We have green blocks for friendly and red for hostile. Fortunately, we've never had to use any of those. The second block, which I'm going to put on the raid stand, is uh, the identifier of the, the radar station, which is carrying the track. That is the first one that which picked it up originally. That picked it up, the first one which picked up the track. Now, uh, each radar station gives uh, a track number. So this first uh, station gives the track number 15. That means that in the last 24 hours, he's picked up 15 tracks, and this is the 15th track. Now, the next block is uh, the designator of the radar station, which is uh, presently carrying the track. In other words, it's moved away from the first radar station, and now another station has picked it up. You see, a, a plane can be flying along the coast. It'd be picked up by a station, and... Uh, uh, is carried by a secondary station. Now, uh, here we have the, uh, the block which indicates the number of aircraft in the blip. Then we have its altitude in multiples of thousands. This would indicate 20,000 20, feet. feet. And there we have uh, uh, its speed, 250 knots. Well, let's take these two raid stands. This one, an unknown ship, we don't know what it is, to, and this one, an inter interceptor, and take them into the control room and see how they are able to be moved about on this giant map and how you're able to keep track of them that way. Now, uh, this is your giant plotting board? Yes, sir. That um, huge table is uh, marked off in squares, exactly like the geographical grid in the plotting board we just saw. Uh, glancing over this board, you can tell what planes are in the air uh, over a vast area, how fast they're going, as well as their direction and altitude. In time of actual attack, 
Well, let's see. First, General, these people who are sitting here, these are your assistants in the operation of the, uh, of the control center. That's correct. It takes a number of people to operate a control center like this. In time of actual attack, uh, I'd be sitting up there on the balcony to the right of those two officers you see, just above the senior controller and his assistant. Well, in other words, then, if you had to pull planes from one place, you could do it very quickly and easily. That'd be a very simple job. All I have to do would be pick up a receiver and give the order. And this is where you keep track of all, everything that's happened to a plane on this big board? That's right. That man uh, is uh, indicating there the status of aircraft, radar stations, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And we come back down to the board again. Uh, how many of these raid stands would you have on a board at a single time? In other words, would you have 50 aircraft in the air? Oh, not normally. I'd say that would be a saturated raid if we had 50 raid stands. You can see that those are identified as uh, friendly for the most part. There he's putting one up out there now that looks like an unknown. That is similar to our unknown that we had right here. That is, exactly. It has a yellow designator on top and is moving in toward our coastline. Mm -hmm. Yes, there he's put up an identification. It's unknown. And then now, the next thing he would do is what, send up an interceptor? Well, uh, he wouldn't send him up, but the uh, direction center would, yes. There, there he actually goes. He's uh, in the process of making his interception right now. That's, uh, looks like a 94C, uh, an all-weather fighter interceptor. Yes, there you see the fighter raid stand going out to make the interception with the unknown. He's on his way out now. Let's see, 25, that's 250 knots. Right. He's moving them closer. Yes, they're moving closer together. You can see from the arrows there the direction in which they're moving. Now they're getting rather close together now. Now these people, they are associated agencies? They are indeed. Uh, we have representatives from the Civil Air uh, Aeronautics Association, the FCDA, the Federal Civil Defense Administration, the Air Rescue Service, and so forth. In case of an actual attack, they'd be mighty busy people. Two, two stands are coming closer all the time. That means that the interceptor is getting up to the unknown aircraft and... Yes, uh, there he is. Obviously the fighter now has, uh, has him in sight. You see, he's pulled up his speed brakes and he should be, he should be headed before, for home right now. Oh, he's peeling off? Yeah, there he goes now. That's a 94C uh, Starfire, one of our latest type straight wing uh, supersonic interceptors. We get him back to the field as soon as we can. Here he comes into land. He's going to refuel, uh, reload his rockets and be ready to go. Oh, that, uh, that uh, parachute there, that's something I haven't seen very often. Yes, I'm glad you noticed that. That's a drogue chute. That plane comes in pretty fast, about 135 knots, and, uh, and uh, we have to have that to save his brakes. Well, now, since we've identified the aircraft, then we can change this from yellow to green, and everything is all right. That's a good idea. We're okay now. Well, now, General, we uh, have scarcely mentioned the overall work of your many planes in this uh, defense setup. Uh, you can have fine radar, but if you didn't have planes for follow-up, then uh, uh, your radar wouldn't be very good. I agree with you. Now, what would you, your various points in your air defense now? Uh, well, uh, there, there are four here. points there. They're very important in air defense. Detection is the first, then identification, interception, and finally destruction. Each is dependent upon the other. And of course, all of these four things, again, are dependent upon precision flying by your pilots. So uh, let's watch now some of the maneuvers that are carried out in this precision flying, uh, for example, with your famous saber knights, and see how they go through these maneuvers. Nothing would suit me better, Earl. I love right. to see them whether it's on movies or otherwise. There you see the boys walking out to their airplanes. They're led by Major Gordon. There he goes, he's walking out to his airplane. He's the commanding officer of one of my fighter interceptor squadrons. I might say that those uh, four young men are fine gentlemen, they're all master pilots. There goes Major Gordon, he's uh, hitting his F-86E down the runway now. There they go, they're taking off now and uh, it's a mighty fine sight. I wish you could have an opportunity to see them. They do uh, some mighty fine precision. Well, you were mentioning earlier that they, they took off on oxygen. I didn't realize that was the case. Yes, uh, however, that isn't an abnormal procedure at all, Earl. You see, if uh, one of those uh, fellows should get right behind the other, uh, he would be breathing the exhaust fumes from that uh, jet engine and would uh, inhale a pretty good uh, shot of carbon well, monoxide. Well, there they go over now. That was a normal roll, or was that something special? Well, that's uh, a little special because uh, they're in very close formation. Also, those maneuvers are being uh, performed very close to the ground. Uh, those men are really precision uh, flyers, as you can see from that formation. The three men who follow, oh, there he goes in another roll. The three men who follow, they guide themselves by the leader. Uh, that's right. It's up to the leader to uh, see after the welfare and the safety of his uh, three wingmen because actually they follow him. They don't really know where they are. 
Well, now, a little bit earlier in the program, General, you mentioned your important group, the Ground Observer Corps. Now, why do you have to have a Ground Observer Corps, and why doesn't radar do the job? That's something we'd like to know. I was hoping you'd ask me that question, and I'm very uh, glad to uh, give you a hypothetical uh, version of how it might work. Let's suppose that an enemy plane, an enemy bomber, had penetrated our coastline and had dropped over into this valley. Now, as I explained a little while ago, the beams from our radar station cannot penetrate these mountains. They'd bounce off the mountain and wouldn't get the plane. They wouldn't show the plane at all. So if he got over here behind, say, the Sierras in this valley, or over in the valley of, the, of our coastal, behind our coastal range, he could only be picked up by the laborers, the farmers, the woodsmen, the school teachers, and any of these fine people who have been willing to give two hours a week to the Ground Observer Corps, who detect where he is by listening to him or seeing. In other words, without the Ground Observer Corps, he could sneak in and perhaps drop a bomb any place that he wished then. That is where he was out of the uh, range of the radar. Well, now, let's see, you have 300,000 people on your rolls. Is that enough? Well, actually, no, it isn't enough. Of that 300,000, only about 109,000 are actually on active duty now, helping the way they should. We need a total of about 500,000. Well, that's certainly something to keep in mind, and I'm sure that all of our viewers will do that. Uh, another piece of equipment that uh, is very interesting you were telling us about is this uh, special plane. Now, what does it do, especially with this uh, big fin on the top here? It looks like uh, a sailfish. This is our latest piece of radar gear. That's an RC-121. It's really a super constellation equipped with uh, special radar and communications gear. This, uh, this uh, obstruction or uh, um, elongation here on top is merely a ray dome. That houses an antenna about eight feet tall, and this bubble underneath here is filled with uh, communications and electronic gear. Oh, yes. Well, suppose we watch the ship then as it might be taking off and see uh, uh, how this would look in actual operation on the, uh, on the airport. It looks rather unwieldy there. I, I guess that's not the case, though. No, people, uh, friends of mine who have flown this airplane tell me that it flies very much like the passenger type aircraft. It's very fast, it has a long range and great endurance. And it uh, makes a very valuable addition to our, to our uh, radar defense net because uh, this plane could be able to vector a fighter interceptor to a hostile bomber track a long distance at sea. Well, it's certainly an amazing and a very beautiful craft, but in general, looking back over these various factors in the defense picture, uh, we see these great uh, radar installations, skilled operators ready to interpret the radar picture, control center where the flight of every plane is carefully watched, and of course, the jet pilots ready to take off on an instant's notice, and then the very faithful and uh, all-important uh, ground observer corps uh, patiently watching the sky. And finally, of course, this uh, flying radar unit that we saw demonstrated here. You know, that's uh, quite a difference from the sort of thing that uh, Paul Revere had to his uh, lantern in the watchtower. <clears throat> yes, Earl, but uh, Paul Revere had one great advantage. People were prepared and willing to act when he gave the word. Today, the people of our country have yet to be convinced that our present danger is a very real one. Organizations such as the Civil Defense Authority and the Ground Observer Corps are vital supplements to our military force. Yet, they remain undermanned while a hostile force overseas grows stronger every day. In other words, then, uh, radar can only warn us. Uh, it may keep us from a surprise attack. But on the other hand, if an attack does come, every one of us has to be ready to do the thing that we will need to do. That's exactly right. Well, General Andrew, I want to thank you for coming to Science in Action to tell us about these matters. Thank you, Dr. Harrell. Uh, Dr. Harrell, I've enjoyed it very much. I'll be back in just a moment with the Animal of the Week. Our Animal of the Week is a very, very rare parrot. It's one of the most rare birds that we've ever had on the program. It is the hawk-headed parrot and it comes from the Amazon Basin and also from northeastern South America. Brought here by Don Philpott. Now, Don, uh, this parrot, uh, I know, is uh, one of many that you brought in at Robinson's. You import a lot of them, but have you ever seen one of these before? Uh, no, Mr. Robinson, who's been in the business for over 100 years, has never seen one before. Perhaps we could raise this crest here so we could see what, uh, what's involved on, the, uh, on that crest. He's not very willing right now. Uh, one thing very odd about these birds is, as you know, no bird likes to be put on their back. And this fellow does. And in that position, he'll play with a stick. Oops. So there he comes up again. Most, uh, most uh, birds, of course, you put them on their back and you have trouble right away soon. Well, 
the hawk name, of course, comes from this crest, which is in the back here. So I presume that's uh, uh, one of the one of the reasons why this fellow's been given that name. Well, Don, I hope you will keep us advised as how this fellow does. And uh, thanks very much for being with us. You're welcome. Now, here's something very strange. The letter A came originally from the ox's head. And on our next program, we'll have an opportunity to find out how that was derived when our special guest will be Dr. Lloyd Reynolds of Reed College in Oregon. We hope that you will plan to be with us then. Thanks a lot. You have just seen another in the fascinating television series, Science in Action. Science in Action is produced by the California Academy of Sciences under the supervision of Dr. Robert C. Miller.